Equipping the Church to Evangelize in the 21st Century. In this series, Minister James Sanderson will be giving a biblical study on the fundamentals of the faith. So as a believer in Jesus, you can be better equipped to win people to Christ and keep them in Christ. Open up your Bible with us as we evangelize in the 21st century. Hello, friends. It's so good to be back with you again as we continue our study on evangelism. Uh, I pray that uh, these studies are helpful and useful to you to lead your friends and family to Christ. Uh, today, we're going to be using our workbook, and I, and I hope you have your workbook with you, Saving Souls in the 21st Century. So if you would, let's, uh, we're going to start in study number 19. And if you would look at page 161, and that is entitled, Is Baptism a Work of Merit? What Does the Bible Say? And this is an important study because so many times our friends are telling us that baptism has nothing to do with salvation. And this is one of the arguments that they use. It's, it's a work, and we're not saved by works. So before we get started, I'd like to introduce our guest with us today. So to my immediate left, who do we have here today with us? I'm Betty Vargas, and I'm a member of the Church of Christ. All right. Thank you, Betty. And who else do we have with us? My name is Mackenzie King, and I'm also a member of the Center Road Church of Christ. And we're so glad to have both of you here today. And the reason I've asked both Betty and Mac in these videos um, is because I'm trying to find people who have a background that have dealt with some of these subjects. And one of the subjects that we're dealing with today, again, is, is, is baptism a work of our merit. So let's start our study out today. And we're going to be looking again at page 161. And let's just read what I've uh, written here at the top of the page. I've spent a lot of time with people in the area of evangelism. When I have a personal study with someone and we reach the subject of baptism in the Bible and see that a person needs to be baptized to be saved, the person I'm studying with more times than not brings up an objection. And this is what they'll tell me. They have been taught that baptism is a work. Since the Bible teaches that we are not saved by works, Ephesians 2.8, they go on to explain to me that this kind of thinking on baptism, connecting it with salvation, uh, it must be incorrect. Despite the fact that we've already showed them how many times baptism and salvation connect with each other. Therefore, this causes a great amount of confusion. So let's see if we can't put some sense to this. So, um, Brother King, I'm going to have you read here first, but let's, let's actually look at that verse, and let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, where it talks about that we're not saved by works, and see if we can't make some sense to this. Ephesians 2, and, uh, chapter 2, and verse 8 to 10, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone bo uh, should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before, beforehand that we should walk in them. Thank you. Appreciate that. So what do you think, Betty? Um, is it pretty clear that we, is this text very clear we're not saved by works? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. So we've got to really see what Paul's talking about here. What kind of works is Paul talking about? Is he talking about works of merit or is he talking about works of faith? And what we're going to discover here is that there is a difference. God wants us to understand that salvation is not something that we can earn or merit. The text was very clear. It's, it's, a, it's a gift of God. Uh, it's not something that we can, we can earn ourselves uh, based on our wonderful performance. Sometimes we like to think uh, more of ourselves than we should. Don't we? We like to, uh, hey, look what I've done. Look what I've look at all the great things I've done. Right, Mac? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought like that? That absolutely, I've, I've created things myself, and it's not me, it's God. And, that, and that's exactly it. So that's really what Paul's talking about here. We can't merit our own salvation. We've already went through one of these studies and showed that the Bible works on a grace faith system. God does His part. That's the grace part. That's what we're saved by. But how do we access that grace? Well, it's through faith. So the Apostle Paul here uh, it was a Jew, and I want you to see how he thinks. Before, the, before he was an Apostle, uh, Paul gives a pretty good description of how he thought about himself before he, came a, before he became a Christian. It's a prideful example of how we can sometimes think of ourselves. 
So we'll just watch how Paul describes himself here. And, and Betty, would you like to read Philippians 3, 4 through 6 and tell us how Paul thought of himself before he became a Christian? If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Blameless. Now that's how Paul thought of himself mm -hmm. before he came to Christ. Paul gives a pretty good example here of how a normal Jew might see himself in relationship to God. Thinking that I have a right to God and his salvation based on, page 162, on who I am and what I've accomplished. Now the problem with that is that there's, there's too many eyes here, right? This is a selfish way of thinking. When we come to Christ, we come to him broken and empty. Uh, realizing that we have continuously and willingly broken God's laws again and again. And because of that, what should happen with our pride? It should go out the window, shouldn't it? Uh, knowing that we deserve nothing. Understanding that it is only by the sacrifice of Jesus and his payment on, for, of his life in our stead that any of us can have the hope of forgiveness. Yet when Paul describes himself before becoming a Christian, he says, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He looked at the law and matched himself up with God's law and said, you know, I've done a pretty good job. Um, he thought to himself, he thought of himself as being righteous. This is the point of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, which Paul is speaking of here. We are not and cannot save ourselves based on our own works or merit. The only thing we have earned is death due to our sins. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. So, let's look at a couple different works here in the Bible, okay? So what about works of faith? Do they play a part of our salvation? Is a work of faith different than a work of merit? Is a work of faith um, different from what I have earned for myself? We need to understand that it is impossible to please God without faith. That's what Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, right? I can't please God unless I have faith. Faith in the Bible is also always an action word. That's what James chapter 2 verse 14 and through 17 says. So, so that means if I have faith, I'm going to be doing something, right? In fact, the only kind of faith the Bible teaches is an active and obedient faith. So, we need to balance this out, okay? Is Paul talking about, about works of merit, or is he talking about works of faith? That's the question. Is it grace that saves us, or is it faith that saves us? I think that's a good question. Now, you might be asking at this point, what is it that saves us? Is it our active and obedient faith, or is it Jesus and his payment for my life on the cross? The answer is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Let's go over this one more time. So, Brother King, would you, would you read uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 here one more time, and we can just go over this again. For by faith you have been saved through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, no one can boast, right? The Bible is clear, our salvation is not of our doing. It is a gift of God. And that gift speaks of the cross of Christ, doesn't it? This is called grace, which translates as unmerited favor. It's not something I merited. This is something God did for me. He went to the cross and died for me. That's why it says we are saved by grace. But let's balance that out. Um, let's look at the, the other part here. That's only half of the story. We cannot access that saving grace without faith. That's what Romans 5, 1 through 2 says, which the Bible uh, teaches as an act of an obedient faith. Faith does not save us. Jesus saves us. Faith is only a response to God's saving grace, but it is a response that God requires of us so that salvation can take place, right? If we're going to please God, how are we going to do it? Hebrews eleven six by faith. So it is through faith. So do you see how, how, how it works? Both parts are an important role. Grace is God's part. 
faith is man's response. But let's make this clear. Without grace, faith would have nothing to stand on. So you have to have both coming together for salvation to take place. God's part, man's part. Now we're going to do what we're going to do is we're going to bring this back to baptism. All right? How does faith connect to baptism? How does baptism play a role in our salvation? That brings us to the subject of baptism. There are at least three verses in the Bible that connect baptism and faith. Let's look at those three. Um, Betty, would you read uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 16, please? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believes and is baptized. Do you see faith, belief, and baptism being connected there? So the two go together, don't they? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Mac, would you read the Galatians 3, 26 and 27 7, and see where faith and baptism connect in this verse? For in Christ Jesus, you are, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized to Christ have put on Christ. All right. There it is again. Faith and baptism. So I want us to look carefully at, at the third example here. In Colossians, my good friend Ed Wharton, who teaches at, at uh, Sunset uh, School of Preaching, he first showed me the beauty and the balance of these verses. Here both God's part, His saving grace, and man's part, obedient faith, come together on the subject of baptism like no other. So if you ever want to share this with a person and try to show somebody, hey, we don't need to be baptized because baptism is a work, Take them to Colossians chapter 2 and let the Bible clearly show you whose work baptism is. So let's go through these verses here. Um, Betty, would you read Colossians chapter 2 verses 9, 10, and 11, please? For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you also you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. All right. I'm sure you've heard me say this many times, but here here in Colossians, the Colossi church had been given fullness in Christ. Um, Brother King, would you say it's important to have fullness in Christ? Absolutely. I mean, it's really important to be fully 100% in Christ. The Colossi church here had that fullness in Christ. Watch where they, where they got it at. It was when they were spiritually circumcised. Now, I've always asked in classes, and I ask the ladies this, Ladies, have you ever been circumcised? And they always say, no. Well, these people, there was both men and women at the Colossi Church, they were circumcised. But again, it's not a physical circumcision. Put the knives away. It's not done by the hands of men. It's a spiritual circumcision. And when, when that happens, who is doing it? It is Jesus. So you can clearly see that Jesus is spiritually circumcising you so that you can have fullness in Christ. But watch what happens when you are spiritually circumcised. He is cutting away the sinful flesh. Is it important to have your sinful flesh cut away? Yes, it is. To get to heaven. You can't get to heaven with sin on you, right? So to get to heaven, you've got to have your spiritual flesh cut away. Who does that? Jesus. When does he do that? When he spiritually circumcises you. Now watch how he does that to people under the new covenant. This is very important. Uh, Brother King, could you read verse 12 for us, please? Okay. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. All right. Did you see where that happened? Having been buried with him, baptism is a burial, right? We've went over that before where you're buried in Christ, okay? So you take this person who is in their sins, you bury them in Christ, and they're raised through their faith. But it's at the point of baptism that Jesus spiritually circumcises you. He spiritually cuts your sinful flesh away, right? Yes, he does. 
And watch what happens in verse 13. Betty, what does verse 13 say? When you were dead in your sins and in the circumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. So when a person is spiritually circumcised and their sinful flesh is cut away, they are made alive. But who does the making of them alive? It is not us. It is Jesus. Right? So can you see this here? Physical circumcision cuts away the skin, but spiritual circumcision cuts away our sin. According to these verses, one more time, who does the, the spiritual circumcising or the cutting away of sin? It is Jesus. It is not us. He does the removing of our sins, saved by grace. But watch this. When does this saving take place? Only when one is buried with him in baptism and raised through our faith. That is an obedient faith through faith. Can you see it? Saved by grace. That's God's part. Through faith. That's man's part. That's man's responsibility. You see how they work together? Now, I, I just have to say this. One time I did baptize a man, and he came up out of the water and literally thumped his chest. And he said this, look what I have done. Hmm. Now, who is he bringing the credit to? Back to himself. In that instance, for that person, he is making baptism something that he did. He is saying, look, this is my work. This is something that I did. But biblically, the Bible says it's what Jesus did. We should come up out of that water humbly and say, look what God did. But I, I did my part. I stepped in by faith. God did his part, took away my sins. Let me use one more example of this. Let's turn the page here. And, and Mac and Betty, see if this doesn't make sense. Think about Noah and the great flood. Okay, God told Noah to build an ark, load the animals and food, and then got on. Was Noah saved because he stepped foot on the ark, or was it because of God's awesome power and protection that got Noah and his family to dry ground? Who do you think got the credit? I mean, we're, 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 talking, about, we're talking about Noah being on that ark for over a year with animals. Who gets the credit for saving Noah? God does. Noah couldn't no. step out on the ark and thump his chest and go, look what I've done, I'm saving myself. Mm -hmm. No, this is what God is doing. There's only way that, that Noah and his family and all those animals got to the other side and got to dry ground over a year in the water was God. God gets the credit. So God gets all the credit for saving Noah, but Noah still had to do his part. He had to get on the ark. Getting on the ark is an act of faith, isn't it? Yes. God told him to step on, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Being baptized is also a st an, an act of faith. We step into the water, and God does the saving. Amen? That's you see right. how that works? Right. Mm -hmm. So, whose work is baptism? Ours or God's? It's God's yes. work. Christ does the removing of sin, Colossians 2.11. But for that work to take place, man must respond to God through an obedient faith, being baptized into him, Colossians 2.12. That is called the work of faith. See how the two parts work together? Both are needed for salvation to occur. Only God can take away our sins. It's not something we do. But God will not do it until we respond with an obedient faith. You have to get on the ark, right? Absolutely. Therefore, baptism does play a vital role in our salvation. So when someone teaches you, you don't need to be baptized, which we hear all the time. I just, yes. mm -hmm. the more I'm out there and evangelize and, 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 and deal with people and these different beliefs and religions, they're all constantly telling me, you don't need to be baptized. You don't need to be baptized to be saved. It has nothing to do with your salvation. The next time somebody teaches you, you don't need to be baptized to be saved, Tell them that would be like trying to tell Noah, don't get on the ark. Mm. Now, if Noah didn't get on the ark, what would have happened to him? He would have drowned. <laughs> he would have drowned with the rest of the world, right? Yeah. And where would we have been today? The seed line of Christ was on that ark, mm -hmm. right? Noah was a man of faith. What if Noah didn't get on that ark? We wouldn't be having this video right now, would we? No. no. So I thank Noah for his obedient faith. 
uh, so that we can have this Bible study and, uh, and help to lead people to Christ. Is this helpful? Yes, yes it, is. it is. Absolutely. Easy, easy to understand, kind of flows easily. Um, being on camera is tough, um, but I hope this study will help you. Um, let's look at one more study that we have here. It's just a real quick one. It's right across the page because what I'm trying to do in this section of the workbook is to really look at all the arguments that people bring against baptism. And I'm trying to show them biblically so that we can show them biblically. You do need to be baptized to be saved. So here's the other one. Is baptism an outward sign of an inward grace? Have you ever heard that before? Yes. yes. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. Some people, we're on page 165. Some people teach that baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace, meaning that a person is saved before they are baptized, and then at some point in the future, that person is baptized as a sign to the world of their salvation. Now, as we've already seen in our study on baptism thus far, baptism is only for dead people, lost people, right? Okay? Not for saved, alive people. And we've covered that very clearly. Baptism is a burial, so you put dead people in that watery grave. You don't put alive people. So they're teaching that you're saved before you're baptized. And then when you get baptized, it's a sign. Um, we saw nowhere in the New Testament that baptism is referred to as a sign. There is over 70 verses on baptism in the New Testament, and there's not one verse that says it's a sign. So this is, this is a theory that's come up. People say it so much, they get to believe in it, right? But the Bible does not connect baptism as a sign. Um, but it does connect the Holy Spirit as a sign. If you go back and you read, just read this to your students. Take them to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, and you'll see that it's not baptism that, that's the sign of our salvation. It's, that the, it's the Holy Spirit. Yet a person does not receive the Holy Spirit until they are baptized. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 32, um, and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, all connect baptism and the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, where does this kind of thinking come from that baptism is a sign to the world of one's salvation that supposedly took place prior to being baptized? It comes out of the Old Testament story of Abraham. I want you to watch the progression of this. So I want you to think about Abraham for a minute. Um, Betty, would you read uh, Genesis 15, 6? Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Okay, so he believes in God. Okay, all right, belief, and he was credited with righteousness. All right, now let's skip up a, a, a little forward here. And Brother King, could you read uh, Genesis 17, 11, please? You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. All right. So see, he believed in God. Two chapters later, he receives the sign of circumcision, which we already talked about just a minute ago in Colossians, yeah. didn't we? All right. And then Romans chapter 4, verse 11, Betty. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. All right, so you can see that pretty clear, right? So circumcision is the sign. See, Abraham was made righteous first, and then he was given the sign of the covenant that God made with him later, Genesis 17. People falsely teach this same progression with salvation in the New Testament. They teach that you pray the sinner's prayer, which we've already covered. That's found nowhere in our New Testament, okay? And, and are saved and made righteous before God. Then later after the prayer, like Abraham, you are given the sign of the agreement at the moment you're baptized. Baptism, an outward sign of an inward grace. Do you see where they come up with this theory? Now what we're going to do is we're going to try to see if that theory is correct with the Bible. So, is circumcision of the Old Testament the same as baptism in the New Testament? To answer that question, let's see the similarities and the non-similarities between circumcision and baptism on the chart on the next page. You will discover that baptism of the New Testament is not circumcision of the Old Testament. Thus, baptism is not an outward sign of an inward grace. 
So this is a false teaching and should be rejected. So let's go to the next page here and let's just look at this chart. And I'm sure you're going to see this chart up on the screen. Um, but uh, Mac, do you see uh, circumcision there? Yes, I do. And then baptism. Now what we're going to do is we're going to try to show if they are similar or not. Okay? So circumcision, when you go to Genesis 17, verse 12, it was to be done on the eighth day of life. All right? Now, let's talk about baptism for a minute. When, we, when, when baptism is done, it's done to a person who is old enough to be taught and chooses to do it. Right? That's what Acts chapter 2, verse 41 says. Those who accepted the message were baptized. Babies can't accept the message, right? So these people are older. They understand about their sin, they're, being, they're able to be taught first, right? And then they respond to baptism. There is no examples of babies being baptized in the, in, the, in the Bible. So, what do you have? You have a difference between circumcision and baptism. Circumcision was done on the eighth day of life. Baptism is done when a person's older. So is circumcision and baptism the same thing in this category? No, no they're not. Okay. Um, circumcision was done, right Betty? Genesis 17, 10, only for the male child, okay? Right. Now, when you come in the New Testament, you'll, you'll see both here in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and you'll also see it with Lydia in Acts chapter 16, that baptism was both for men and women, right? So in this category, is baptism and circumcision the same thing? No. no. See, they're, they're equating that they're the same thing. Now, here's where baptism and circumcision is connected, which Paul did over here in Colossians, as we just seen. Circumcision is to cut away the foreskin, right? Genesis 4, uh, verse 25. But baptism is to cut away the sin. We see that in Colossians 2, 11 through 13. You see that? Now, in that way, circumcision and baptism are similar. Would you agree? Yes. Okay, all right. Circumcision... In Genesis 17:11 and 4:11, we've already read them, is a sign of the covenant. Okay, that's what circumcision does. It, it says, "Yes, this is a sign that you are my child, that my, my people." But when we come to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit is a Christian seal or sign. So in that way, they are not similar. No. It never says anywhere in the Bible that baptism is a sign. And yet our religious friends are coming along and saying, it's, a sign, it's an outward sign of an inward grace. And they say it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. But it's not biblical. Nowhere does it say that. This is a theory. And we're trying to get back to the scriptures and destroy these theories. And one more. Circumcision is done by the parent's faith, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're eight days old, and you're going to be circumcised, it's not the child's choice. The child has no belief. They don't even know if they believe in God or not. So you have the faith of the parents stepping in and circumcising their children. But when you come to baptism in the New Testament, what do you see in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27, Colossians 2, 12, Acts 2, 41, Acts 8, 36 through 38, Acts 22, 16? Baptism is always done by the faith of the person being baptized. Right. So in that way, circumcision and baptism are not the same. So just because Paul makes one connection with circumcision and baptism, that doesn't mean that every aspect of it is the same. So again, what is our sign or seal that we are God's children? It's the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. When do we receive that sign? When we are baptized. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each and every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's your sign. There's your seal. God takes away our sins, buries that dead body uh, uh, of, of sin into Christ, and raises up a new person, and we are united with him in his family. Do you see how it works? Does that make sense? It does. Yes, sir. So can these studies, are they easy enough, do they flow easy enough to go and study with someone and show them maybe some errors that they've been taught? Yes, yes it is. Always do it in love, church. Always be kind to people, but show them the truth of God's Word. I pray this video has helped you.
Uh, come back next time. Uh, we're going to continue these studies, and I just thank you so much for being with us. Thanks again.